So welcome to uh, the 10th edition of SG STEM uh, Talk and Trivia. I'm Marcus and this is... Hello guys, I'm Kanan. How's everybody doing? Yep, today um, we are fortunate to have with us um, Anbu, Ms. Anbarasi Bhupal, uh, who is Deputy's Chief Executive of Acres and I've known her for I think almost a decade now. And she's always, uh, she's a, a stalwart for uh, in nature in Singapore, always speaking out for uh, wildlife and concern about their wide well-being as well as biodiversity in Singapore. So she's always present in meetings and she can tell you uh, on, on any given day what are the issues about wildlife and coexistence in Singapore. And today we're lucky to have her share with us um, more about the role of ACUS in giving animals a voice um, in native wildlife coexistence as well as uh, how the crime unit is battling the, the online illegal wildlife trade. So interesting things. And if we are lucky, we have time at the end. Uh, we might be taken on uh, like a Blair Witch journey to see some of the behind the scenes look at, uh, at what, what ACUS is doing for, for wildlife in Singapore. So uh, over to you, Anvo. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Kanan. Um, let me... uh, Kanan, you gotta stop sharing screen first. Yeah. Okay. I hope you can see. Yes. We can. Okay. Great. Um, hi, everyone. And um, so today, since we have a short period of time, I'm just going to touch on um, stuff that Acres does related to wildlife crime and uh, a bit more information on the native wildlife coexistence uh, work that our uh, wildlife management team uh, does. So before that, if I can just um, give a very brief introduction, we are a local charity organization for some who has not heard about us and uh, we speak up for all animals. So we believe that all animals matter. Um, and they are sentient beings and feel, feel just like you and I. So um, instead of going through details of different departments, I just thought I will share with you how advocacy work, uh, works. So if uh, someone slips and falls, sorry about very cheesy images from internet, but um, I just uh, was thinking of uh, finding a simple way to explain to you all. And uh, when it comes to advocacy work, for example, if you take someone uh, slipping and falling off a wet floor, a wet floor um, there are groups, organizations, or people who will help to uh, put up a sign that says, uh, be careful, there's wet floor uh, here. It is quite glamorous as well, because uh, you, know, you can put a name there saying that we are preventing people from falling. And there are people, groups who will help people who have fallen by treating them, uh, treating their injuries, which is also quite attractive um, and glamorous work to do because you can have before and after photos. So that is very related to uh, rescue work that we do. And there is always uh, the stuff that is done behind the scenes that no one would want to see or no one will be able to see, which is really fixing the leak. So people uh, don't fall on a slippery floor. So that is where the advocacy work comes in. And you can hardly see any bling there because um, it needs to be done. It needs to be done behind the scenes. And uh, so people don't fall on the floor. So uh, something that ACUS tries to do is do all of this. So we do education work. We, do, um, we campaign for changes, whether it's policy level or legislative changes. We also rescue when uh, the incident has already happened. Um, say animals who are smuggled and brought inside Singapore already from the illegal wildlife trade. So we also fight fire during uh, that period. And uh, some part of education and mitigation, what we do from preventing people from falling, like putting up a sign would be more on wildlife management itself. So uh, this is a very simple uh, way of explaining how our animal advocacy work, uh, works here in Singapore. So uh, we do this work through different focus areas. So um, what I will not be touching today is really community outreach and humane education, uh, where we continue and uh, sometimes repeat a lot of pointers on how people can help animals. The objective is to really run out of business at some point. Um, then I think we are going in the right direction. If we don't need a wildlife rescue center here in a few decades time uh, for illegally trafficked animals, then I think we have gone in the right direction. Um, so some of you might, many people confuse, sorry, my dog is growling, but many people, uh, many people would have wondered uh, if the monkey in our logo is actually uh, a long tail macaque. 
usually it's the rooster who joins me during the Zoom talks, but uh, the roosters are sleeping during this time. So the dogs are surrounding me, so they are growling at each other for some reason. So uh, we, our logo is actually a blue monkey and people usually wonder if it's a long tail macaque. I just want to give you a brief introduction. It all started off with the wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade. And this monkey was uh, smuggled in from Africa and uh, kept as an illegal pet. And thanks to a tip off, uh, this monkey was sent back to <coughs> Uh, Africa. This is the monkey. We named him Blue. Um, he's a velvet monkey and uh, he was, he had a second chance in the wild with uh, actually another female monkey and they did pretty good. He already died in the wild. So uh, he became a symbol of joy and hope because that is why we built the rescue center. We wanted to give the victims of the illegal wildlife trade a second chance um, after what they've been through. So the animals whom we see from the illegal wildlife trade comes in different colors, shapes, species, and every time we see a new species, um, unlike the collection, we actually, um, it makes us sad because it shows that we have a lot more work to do. Um, I think it is a similar feeling of other organizations who are also looking into the wildlife trade here in Singapore, like, um, and Parks and the Zoo as well. So whenever we see um, a new species, um, it shows that there's a lot more work to do, actually. So uh, in the past, there's been a lot of primates like monkeys, um, but recently there are smaller uh, species of monkeys who appear in the trade, like marmosets, uh, for example. And a lot of other species who get uh, confiscated seeds are tortoises and turtles, uh, smaller lizards like geckos, sometimes even green iguanas, and smaller snakes like pythons, ball pythons. <clears throat> So um, recently the trend has changed to smaller animals, like I mentioned. This sugar glider was actually found, is a marsupial and was found, I remember a friend called me from a pub saying that there is a injured squirrel outside the pub at midnight. So we asked for a photo, then we realized that, hey, this is a sugar glider, this is not even a native species. So most often when we find abandoned prohibited animals, it's really by chance where people report some of the animal and then we find them. Um, so this is the part where we help people who fell down, right, like firefighting. And every year we get more than 50 uh, exotic wild animals and this does not include what NPACs may handle or the uh, WRS might handle. So this is really uh, cases that people may call our hotline. And we may transfer some of these animals to the zoo, but many animals may not even make it through the rescue, like this uh, soft-shell turtle who was released into the sea, uh, which is a freshwater species, and uh, did not make it even at the site. This iguana also did not pull through, was found in a dustbin behind a veterinary clinic. This leopard tortoise also did not pull through. What you don't see here is a big tumor behind uh, her shell. So a lot of these animals don't come in good shape at all. This is actually at Mandai. This photo was taken behind the bus stop at Mandai. <clears throat> so what our animal crime investigation unit does is a lot of surveillance and monitoring. Um, a lot of things are done manually because we don't have very high, um, uh, very technical uh, softwares and applications. So we do a lot of things manually and also the market online evolves a lot. So we have to uh, change our search terms, um, change even our platforms a lot. Um, currently, many platforms um, are progressing, but new platforms open, anyone can open an account to sell or buy. It's just so easy and it makes uh, our life difficult in, to tackle the issue as well. Um, so we work very closely with, we used to work closely with ABA now and PUPS. So we work close with, closely with them uh, in order to share cases, share some of the caseload so we can do uh, some of the investigative work, uh, but we do, not, we do not have any enforcement powers. So at the end of the day, NPAX uh, will come in to do the enforcement work. Um, so I don't have the 2019 data yet, but you can see that uh, the parts and um, live animals, this is some of the online listing, has really been increasing. And the animals whom we see here in Singapore, this is a snapping turtle trying to drink from a puddle in a playground. Um, so uh, the kind of cases that we see is really, but this is a sugar glider who was hit by a vehicle on the road as well. So this is really at the extreme and we feel horrible knowing that we couldn't stop this from happening. So. Um, because they have already passed through all the stages of being smuggled, being kept illegally, and also being abandoned as well. 
So we continue to do the monitoring of the online trade advertisements, listings. Uh, we try to work with the platforms. We do roundtables uh, with Facebook, with Instagram, with Interpol, with uh, NPATS and then AVA as well uh, to figure out what are the challenges that a local organization can face that uh, these people can play a role in actively tackling the issue. Um, I just want to share some of the screenshots that we have had from Sting Operation. So we do do Sting Operations. <clears throat> Sting Operation is also firefighting uh, because uh, the problem is already there and we are going to pose as buyers and then buy the animal. Um, it involves risks and uh, it, we do not want to uh, get involved in entrapment as well. So we are careful. Uh, we work closely with the enforcement agency to get these things done. <clears throat> So you can see how uh, they are aware that the item is control item, so they cannot claim ignorance. And if you need it, they will always, uh, sellers will always uh, show you what else they have. So how, how long you have to wait. And it's quite shocking to see how easy it is. You just need to wait for one week and he, can, he or she can get leopard claws uh, with a golden frame. And it is quite lucrative. You can see how expensive they are, $1,000 or more a few hundred dollars, so they take the risk. Uh, that person was caught. And this was from a recent ops uh, in December 2019. Um, actually, we did not go public with this because we didn't want to expose ourselves, but um, unfortunately or fortunately, the media actually picked it up uh, because good job done by NPAX was actually prosecuted. The person was prosecuted in the court. Um, and the media actually picked it up from the court, which is also good for raising awareness uh, at the end. And this is a gharial being sold. Um, and the deal was done in Jurong West, um, which was pretty shocking because, you know, CITES listed species and uh, the person was trying to openly sell this animal. This photo was taken uh, during the ops itself. So I'm not going to show the videos, uh, mainly also because of the time and also um, the audio has not been edited yet. So we can't reveal who has been involved in the ops. So um, this was from a telegram case, the Gario. And uh, we, you know, at every case, we, you try to look for silver lining, right? So at least we were like, okay, the seller is looking at, if you cannot at least go and surrender, give to Acres or send to the zoo. <laughs> the seller was sharing in the group chats that, uh, you know, for welfare, at least go and send to a uh, rescue center or someone else. So um, there's a lot of discussions. We monitor what's happening. So uh, we know what's happening, but it's just that we may always not choose to fight fire all the time. We may want to work on preventing the fire from happening. Um, so that is illegal wildlife trade. And what about legal wildlife trade? Sorry, um, uh, the title was supposed to be, is legal wildlife trade a concern to so this is also from the recent one. I'm not going to talk about shark spin and all that. I think these are issues that many people are aware of. Uh, but this is from our recent campaign on the wet market, um, where we questioned on the sale of wild caught uh, Asiatic soft shell turtles in our wet markets in horrible conditions. I was involved in this ops. Um, and I've seen the same turtle there for several weeks. So we know uh, how long these turtles are living in such tubs, uh, waiting just to be sold. <coughs> So uh, this is a species that I'm talking about. Uh, because the species is CITES listed, you can get the data of import. And these are the wild caught turtles imported every year. Um, that is quite shocking, actually. So uh, the demand here. So we felt that we also need to raise awareness on the demand that we're create, creating, because many of us might not be aware uh, where these turtles are coming from, because um, it might be advertised as captive bred turtles, farmed turtles. Um, so one of the alternatives that we pushed for, pushing for still is that uh, live animals should not be sold, but can it all be, the slaughter be restricted to slaughterhouses. So uh, the vendors can still sell, but they can, they're selling just the meat, at least for the welfare reasons of these animals and the disease concerns as well. Uh, because we recorded in our video that uh, they were using the same gloves when they're handling uh, these wild caught animals and the cash. So you don't even have to buy the meat. I think you go to the vegetarian, uh, vegetable stalls and then uh, buy vegetables. You might have the cash that has, been, that has touched the animal before. <clears throat> so what happens to the animals rescued? We try our best to uh, repatriate them. Uh, like blue there, um, uh, these tortoises were sent back to India. I'm just gonna 
you know, skim through these slides very quickly. Uh, so 51 tortoises were sent. We have uh, repatriated close about 70 over wild animals so far. Uh, smuggling is so much easier and faster, not that I've done before, but um, the repatriation takes a long time because you have to get the paperwork done, the veterinary health certs, um, uh, and also work with the other government agency and the partner NGO to secure uh, all the arrangement properly and also raise the funds and then to the repatriation. For start tortoises, it took us a few years, but at least now we have set the formula. So hopefully the next round will be uh, less challenging. So um, I have, uh, hopefully I'm keeping to the time, but uh, I've moved on to the next topic, um, which is on human wildlife interactions. So it's, it's quite different, uh, but again, we have to remember that it's never about just about animals. Uh, when we work for the animals, it's always about working with people. So if we can't patiently explain the issue or communicate clearly to the people, we will never be able to help animals or the environment. So um, when it comes to human wildlife interactions, Singapore has a lot of potential uh, to uh, be a very good positive example. Um, I think we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, managing human wildlife interactions. Um, Thankfully, many people do, you know, have positive interactions. It's just that they don't go online and complain about it. Um, but when uh, people do have negative interactions, it comes uh, very quickly on online. Uh, it appears on social media uh, with uh, videos of monkeys, uh, you know, grabbing food or plastic bags. Um, authors giving a, you know, uh, are making an appearance and people saying that uh, the kid was very close to the author. So a lot of these animals can get a bad rep just from a few short seconds of clips that are posted online. Uh, but just I just wanted to show this uh, image of um, how intricate and well connected our uh, green areas are going to be in the future. Um, I'm not going to talk about the quality of the forest. I think that is a very big discussion, uh, a different topic, a deep and intense topic. But when we're talking about greenery, uh, the park connectors are not, not just going to be for people to jog and exercise and do yoga. It's going to be also uh, for animals to use and cross. Um, what we feel from Acres when we're doing the groundwork is that uh, what we often see also from our experiences is that a lot of people uh, like animals um, and uh, they move into condos which are named um, very green themed, forest themed, there is an eco or a green or a forest or uh, some green related uh, name to the condo or a residential estate, but they might not be prepared to see beyond uh, butterflies and flowers and birds. So when it becomes a garden lizard uh, or a small garden snake or a monitor lizard um, or other reptiles, um, forget about reptiles, but also for mammals like uh, monkeys, they are not aware of what to do, what not to do. So that is where the uh, so-called conflict uh, comes about. We see this on a daily basis. So I'm trying really not to use the word conflict, uh, but we see conflict on a daily basis. I think Kanan will also agree because he has just started off with our wildlife management team, which is great. So it is, uh, we also have an intern uh, working from uh, NUS um, who has also worked with us for a few months now on, uh, on the scene in the ground itself uh, to face wildlife conflict uh, up front. So we handled up to 60 cases. Last month was um, close to 70 cases, actually. And uh, we expect that um, this month and the next month is going to be even worse. Um, may not be related to circuit breaker, may be related, but also um, there is a lot of offerings in the coming month. So uh, when all the offerings stop, that is when the conflict can happen because when there's still food available, there might not be a negative interaction. The animals just get used to, oh, there's gonna be oranges, there's gonna be cakes and all that. And after that, uh, when they don't see the food anymore, that is when they are going to like uh, approach humans um, looking for the food that they are trained to. So it is a sensitive topic. Um, so we will have to engage accordingly as well. So uh, we do advise, we visit, we sometimes engage, we even do training uh, for the residents, property managers and uh, estate managers uh, on how they can manage uh, conflict situations on their own. So they don't always need and parks and acres around. Uh, can they manage on their own? And also advise the residents that, hey, you're living near this place and this is what you should expect. 
and this is what you should be empowered with so you don't have a problem in the future. This photo is actually a monkey, a uh, long-tailed macaque at uh, the airport. Of course, when there is a case like this, we are not going to advise and ask them to coexist. When there is a need for removal and relocation, uh, we will uh, carry it out. Um, sometimes also people put up uh, cases like this happen. Um, so we can choose to, we went for, into this house for a snake who was stuck on a glue trap. Uh, but when we went, we saw this uh, mist net all over the, the garden of the house and we realized that uh, we found that a lot of fruit beds were, they were just dead on the netting uh, from heat, uh, starvation, dehydration. Um, it was quite a gory sight. Um, this is the kind of, you know, uh, horror moments for us. So we can choose to be angry and walk away or we can choose to see this as an opportunity for education. So uh, we spoke to the person, we spoke to the family, we removed all the netting, we spent about one and a half hours there cutting everything out, looking also for any live animals stuck still in the netting. So uh, we spent some time educating the residents. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. We sometimes, uh, I wanted to put screenshots of conversations that we have on hotline. Uh, it's pretty interesting uh, to see uh, the responses from public and it also allows us to learn and pick up on how else can we change our communication strategy. Um, also, we find animals stuck to um, debris like this, like fishing hook. Uh, this one had a hook all the way inside. Um, of course, this is the minor and if I use another animal's photo, you know, the response might be different. So sometimes for raising awareness, uh, we also have to strategize cases. Um, I, I, I think I'm close to the end timing, so I'm just going to show you a couple of um, slides on um, the recent data. So what ACRES does is we have monthly meetings where all the staff sit down and share data from each department. So the rescue team is aware of where are the conflict cases happening for monkeys so we can advise properly, um, where the road kills happening. So we share data every month. So this is uh, for June. Um, this is a screenshot of the slide that I wanted to show you and you can see in a month how many macaque cases happen and if I can overlay this with the park connector slide that I showed earlier, I think we can clearly see uh, a correlation because the animals are just using park connectors as corridors and we have HTB blocks beside the park connectors. So we need to educate every single resident on what to do, what not to do. It is a very daunting task, uh, but it is possible. It's not impossible. And also understand why these monkeys are moving. And uh, we can tell stories on how probably this particular monkey has moved across a certain area for, some, for a certain period of time. And we can tell the residents that, um, hey, uh, just give us a few weeks and this monkey will move away. Um, and also it will show trends on developments. So when we attend engagements with agencies on developments, we can actually uh, share with them that there is a trend that's happening. There are animals leaving this place and moving aside, uh, moving around. So it could be because of the development. So uh, we can also talk about, give some pointers about connectivity. <laughs> we also list everything, uh, all the locations, the sites, so we can understand and uh, put something together or to find out what is happening because on an everyday basis, we see these things um, on a daily basis. So it's very important to have a um, bigger picture view. Otherwise, we will never stop rescuing animals. We will never stop rescuing animals on blue traps, poison pigeons, and uh, so many other issues. I think we, what we need, Singapore needs, is a much more holistic approach. So I just want to end the set of slides with this story. Uh, it is a self-told story. So, you know, it needs science to back this up. So I'm just going to give this disclaimer. So we have been uh, culling crows for a decade at least now, and uh, it has been, uh, you know, it has shown uh, impact on the number of crows going down. So I have this theory that uh, because we removed scavengers without looking at the food source that is available, we may have let other scavengers take over. So we are looking at rats, and uh, if we can, you know, even uh, connect the dots with a uh, number of alfresco dinings and coffee shops and eateries that have developed over the past few years and the number of rats who have you know uh, started to survive uh, in the urban um, areas uh, that could be a relation to why the, we have a lot more python sightings in urban areas 
So every time we meet, I think uh, we work with WRS and NUS uh, and NPACs on this as well, where, uh, you know, you, we take pythons, we rescue pythons from say Orchard Road and you may choose to release somewhere else, but we still keep getting pythons in urban areas, mainly because of rats. So I sometimes wonder whether it's all related. Probably it is, uh, maybe it is not, but it remains to be proven. Uh, whether we have altered uh, by removing a certain animal, uh, I think there's also efforts to um, probably look into managing uh, minor population as well. There's been a few pilots that has happened, including gassing a tree full of miners. Um, and uh, currently pigeons are poisoned on a daily basis. Uh, we just spoke to uh, Siva earlier about uh, poisoning of pigeons. Um, it's happening in Holland now, but uh, to be honest, it happens island wide. So during COVID, I think the town councils faced a lot of complaints from public. So they were poisoned everywhere. And uh, poisoning is uh, scientifically proven not to work because the food sources still remain the same. And uh, it is also not uh, targeted. So other birds also consume it. And uh, if pigeons consume the poison and the other predators uh, uh, prey upon them, uh, the effect can be also damaging. So we have rescued other species of birds who have also been poisoned, protected species. So um, I've come to the last slide, uh, but I just wanted to throw this thought out there because um, I believe the audience here also championing the cause for wildlife protection, environmental protection in Singapore. So um, it is very important to look at the bigger picture and uh, manage wild animals, the environment and people, the community um, in a better way that is backed up heavily by science and compassion. Uh, I strongly believe that this is what we really need uh, for Singapore. And uh, one last slide before we move, <laughs> because we are a charity organization, because animals matter to us, but sometimes we wonder how far does the money matter. So I just want to share uh, how we operate. If you all are wondering how does ACRES operate, um, we always run on deficit, but thankfully this year, hopefully we are not in deficit. Um, but this is the reality, like behind the scenes is what happens. And... Um, but in case you also wonder what happens, what does Acres do behind the scenes? Does the team just wait for calls and sit and um, leave? Or is it uh, going to be, uh, do we have a business and action plan? Uh, yes, we do. We have a business plan. We have an action plan. We have deadlines. We have performance bonus and everything. So we try to have as much structure as possible so we can achieve the targets for the animals. So uh, this is my last slide. And... I hope um, there is time for a little walk to the enclosure, Marcus. We do. Uh, yes, we definitely do. Uh, so I think we, we can do the Q and A at the same time as uh, your walk. So we will allow you time to switch to your device while <laughs> Kanan would uh, prepare the questions. Hope yes, we do. So okay. I think Ambu is going to switch to her phone. Yes. And uh, let me just find the questions. And okay, found it. And we'll need to highlight highlight her phone when she logs in onto onto the device. Yep. So Anbu is currently in the conference room and moving to uh, the back of house uh, area of uh, Acres with her phone. So she have to fill up with that. So, uh, and one more shout out, if you're going to play uh, the trivia later, do note that uh, there is a dollar for dollar uh, matching by the government for all charity organizations in Singapore. So, uh, do note, uh, well, you get, uh, acres could, if it's the winner, they could get uh, twice the amount. I'm just going to walk over to the, I'm just going to walk over to the enclosure. Okay. Uh, I'm so at Acres I, now, so you guys are getting behind the scenes also. Wait, 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 because we'll we don't want to disturb light, yeah. animals who are not nocturnal, so I'm just going to try my luck to see if, if I can find any nocturnal animals active. Okay. So I'm entering our quarantine and rehabilitation area. And I'm also using a red light so I don't disturb the animals.
we were talking about uh, Chua Chukang ghost stories just now when Andrew was trying this out. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we are situated very close to the cemetery, if that helps. <laughs> so, okay, this is the enclosure where we have some baby civets. Oh, there's a gecko. Um, okay, they are awake. So I hope you can see them. It's on the left side of the screen. Yep. So he's actually climbing up. How did the civets uh, get here, Anbu? Uh, oh, they are all here. Um, so they were baby civets who were rescued uh, from... Uh, from a residential estate. But what happened is that um, we tried reunion, but it didn't work. Uh, we always try reunion first. Only when that doesn't work, then we will, uh, you know, uh, try to take them in for rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. These three guys, oh, there is one coming up here. Um, these three guys were uh, hand raised by us. So they came in eyes not open. So um, it is a day and night feeding of milk. It's a lot of resources spent. So we would prefer that uh, they are left in the wild with their own parents first uh, before we can uh, decide to interfere. Yeah. So um, how long would it take for them to be ready for the wild from since, since the day they come in? A few months. Um, early this year, we got one in January. Only when the circuit breaker started, we actually did the release back into the wild. So it can take a few months um, before we finally release them to the wild. I'm sorry, I'm just going to take out the phone. So the, the investment in, in terms of staff, in terms of logistics and resources would be quite phenomenal for, for each. Uh, yes, safe. yes, yeah. Um, so it is, uh, we have to have night shift animal caregivers. Currently we have only uh, rescue officers. So we need hmm. to make sure that we have uh, night staff as well to feed them. And, oh, there is one up close Ooh. here. Um, to feed them, we also give enrichment at night time. Um, so around 10 o'clock, someone will come in and do the enrichment for them. So uh, once they are uh, graduating <laughs> from the ICU, which is an incubator, incubator, from there they will come out to a smaller cage. From there they come out to this cage. And after that, they go to another bigger cage, which is here. So currently we don't have anyone uh, in this cage. Um, after this, it's a final goodbye back to the wild. We will do the release at uh, uh, NPAC's approved site. So, um, okay. Okay, I think that's how far our luck... Oh, there is one here. <laughs> Looking at her. Um, I think that's how lucky we are today. Only one or two heads popped out, which is fine. So I think I can continue to take questions now. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Can do. Yeah, we got a couple of questions. Probably I think okay. we'll we'll do five from the list, people. We'll do five from the list. So um, let's see. Uh, Audrey wants to know uh, what are the difficulties or challenges of repatriating species, and how many okay. percent of rescued animals actually make it back home? Okay. Uh, how many rescued animals? So maybe I will cover the how many percentage of rescued animals make it back home. Um, I'm walking back to the office slowly. So um, for rescued animals, if it's native animals, uh, injured animals or displaced animals, most of them are released back into the wild, particularly when they are just rescued because of a conflict situation. Um, but if they are baby animals who are rescued uh, mainly with birds, the mortality rate is slightly high. Mm -hmm. I would say about 40% uh, over. Because wild animals, if they are so injured that they can be rescued, uh, immobilized, uh, usually the chances are very low. 
Um, but uh, the baby animals, we manage to rehabilitate and uh, release them back to the wild. When it comes to exotic wild animals, um, the return, which is repatriation, uh, back to the country of origin is very, very low, uh, mainly because of the challenges. So that comes to a second part of the question, which is um, um, securing a safe uh, space, habitat for release in the first place. So uh, we have, um, for example, for India, it took us a long time before we could um, actually uh, secure a protected area where we could uh, release them. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, Marcus and Kanan, I'm going to move on to the computer, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Okay, while we're waiting for Anbu to move on to the computer. Okay, um, I'm back. <laughs> I hope you all see Saul Mota and Sunshine and Brownie along the way. <laughs> Um, so the challenges with repatriation is to uh, secure a protected area for release because it's never just shipping the animals and then releasing them into the wild. So we, it is our responsibility to ensure that uh, they are also monitored and uh, the release site is a protected site so they don't enter the trade again after all the effort that's been put on. So uh, we have to work with the government who manages the release operations but we also try to find the NGO partner to work with because I think uh, the NGOs and nonprofits in their own countries know how to work well with their own government. So uh, we find the NGO partner, then we start the project and send them over. Okay. And uh, also the less endangered the species is, it's uh, more challenging to send. So we have some radiated tortoises that we want to send. We have a contact to send. But uh, there are right, only a few hundreds left in the wild and we have five. I'm sure there are more cases that come in. Um, just yesterday, there was a release by ICA on uh, leopard tortoises being confiscated also. So um, they are critically endangered, but still uh, the government in Madagascar, they are battling, uh, you know, that there was a raid with thousands of these tortoises in a house. Many of them died as well. So they are also battling their own local uh, issues before we could send them back. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, next question. Uh, is from Siva. Siva wants to know, I've lost a question, I've lost a question. Siva wants to know, do you think that the appearance of new smaller species in the trade could be the result of relatively successful enforcement against the trade of larger species? Or is it the result of the interest in acqu acquiring less typical species? Let me just read this again. Um, so uh, it is a combination of both and also the difficulty in hiding larger animals in Singapore. As there are more eyes and ears uh, here in Singapore, I think they will report if they hear a monkey from someone's flat um, compared to a few years ago. So more and more people are aware. So it's going to be difficult for people to keep larger animals. Uh, if I could comment just on Singapore's side. Um, and uh, so the ease of smuggling is also uh, less challenging when it comes to smaller animals like uh, scorpions, uh, leopard geckos, um, hedgehogs. Uh, they are literally called pocket pets, which is quite scary. So uh, people just uh, stuff them in, uh, sometimes in their cars, glove compartments, and then bring them in. Um, and once uh, people create a demand or start posting on social media, it also accelerates the interest uh, in these animals. Sometimes there's a network and uh, Telegram group chats form. People actually follow certain hashtags and uh, you can actually find the network after that. Okay. Um, okay. I think we'll do just do one more question uh, due to time. Uh, this question is by uh, Cherry. Uh, Cherry wants to know uh, if it is challenging to change the mindset of the public, like such as the uh, misunderstanding of pythons, and would you give any suggestions or tips on reaching out to the public effectively? Um, yes, it is always challenging. Not the challenge, right? <laughs> it was so easy. Someone would have done it before us. So um, we have to constantly evolve. Uh, sometimes we have to put ourselves in their position to see what is it that they are worried about. Um, we look at the house. If the house looks messy, and then the pythons come, we tell them that you you know you're attracting pythons. We remove one, and then there's going to be another one because the rats are visiting your house. Um, 
sometimes uh, we also uh, use humor as well. We can tell people that do you prefer seeing more rats or do you you, do, you don't mind seeing one python at some you know uh, um, then you can just at least call us right. So. Um, we do use them sometimes, but um, there is no single way to engage public, really. Um, we are going to try one more method uh, coming up soon. We will be releasing a series of webinars, um, not an actual seminar, but uh, we will be doing a series of humor and sarcasm plus information uh, put together as a campaign. Um, uh, depending on the animal, um, we need to share the positive aspect of the animals uh, it, at a certain dose. Not overdo it, but at a certain dose, um, because sometimes people don't like pro-animal people. So we need to reach out, connect with them. There's no point just only talking to animal lovers, right? So uh, we need to really connect with them. So we have to use um, facts and uh, the benefits of having these animals in our environment as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think that's that works. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions from me. Uh, Marcus? So I have, maybe have uh, one last question. So uh, you just um, outed Arcanan as a new, one of the newest staff in Acres. Yes. Uh, do you have anything to say about his first week at work? I think the monkeys are scared of him. <laughs> <laughs> So he has, uh, he has been doing monkey guarding um, at one of the estates. We work closely with the NPARC, so we are handling one of the sites uh, that NPARC is uh, receiving feedbacks from in Bukitima. So they, um, uh, Kanan and uh, two of our teammates, they have been there every day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Yep. Uh, 12 hours of uh, stalking monkeys. So I so far we have heard a lot of um, good things like he's doing well and, uh, you know, really tekaning the monkey so that good. But we should hear from Kanda and how it's going. I think I think they recognize my face now, and uh, I think that's good. So yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing less and less of the monkeys every day, so that's good. But the, I, I like to I like to think. Sorry. The biggest challenge would be to uh, manage the residents. So. Yeah, I think resident guarding is more difficult than monkey guarding. Yeah, and I like to think that the monkeys will miss me on the weekends, but I don't think they will. They're probably happy that I'm not there. So yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much uh, for your time, Anvu. Um, we don't know how to thank you enough. So I'm going to unmute everyone, so warning, uh, so that we can all say uh, thank you to Anvu while Kanan prepares his uh, for the trivial section for after this. So unmute all. Thanks, Anvu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anvu. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. So um, don't go away. Uh, you can unmute. Uh, you could mute yourself after you are said your thank you. So uh, Kanan's gonna take over to share the screen, and we're gonna start the trivia section. There we are, and share screen. Let's go. All right. So for those of you who are um, first-time players. Uh, we do a trivia pot contribution as well, so you can get to pick your be preferred beneficiary and uh, how, mu how much you want to donate. So you can put that over here. And um, at the end of the quiz, send us your answers. Yeah, and Marcus has dropped the link there, so you can do that as well. So uh, without further ado, does anyone need more time? Does anyone need more time to set up your quiz deets? on uh, tinyurl.com slash sgstem dash trivia. I think almost everyone here is an old hand, but we'll quickly go through the rules uh, for limited time. We're going to play four rounds, including one bonus round. And this week's theme is POV uh, because of the uh, pandan smell that's coming out from um, some of the people's homes this last week and this week. Uh, everyone is to update the live Google Sheet, which I've just pasted in, uh, tinyurl.com slash sgstem dash trivia. And please drop in your team name as well as your preferred beneficiary. Uh, so how it works is that uh, the winner of the trivia gets to decide where the trivia pot goes to uh, benefit. So uh, we have an honor code. Uh, no checking up the answers online or referring to books. Uh, no looking up the answers. But if you are playing with it with a group, uh, you can share that your knowledge among your group and pick the best answer. At the end, it's closed book. We 
take a photo or email your answers uh, with the team name to sgstem.toptrivia at gmail.com. We'll flash this again at the end. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's an honor code. So, Kanan, uh, please, I see Let's the... go. So, yeah, so P-U-B, oh, and P stands for plant. Of course, a lot of people have been saying that our quizzes have been way too uh, animal-centric. So, let's go with some plants. What, which of the following terms is synonymous with botany? Which of the following terms is synonymous with botany? A, plantology, B, herbalism, C, phytology, and D, foliology. Which of the following terms is synonymous with botany? Okay. Uh, I'll be kind of going through the questions quite quickly. Of course, we try to keep to our 9 p.m. thing. I know we don't, but we try. Uh, if you guys need questions repeated, right, just shout in the chat. 85% of extant plant life can be found in A, the Amazon rainforest, B, the Congo rainforest, C, the oceans, or D, Lake Baikal. 85% of plant life can be found in the Amazon rainforest, Congo rainforest, oceans, or Lake Baikal. Okay. Brazil wood for Brasilia echinata gets its name from the country of Brazil. True or false question? Brazil wood gets its name from the country of Brazil. I don't know whether this is a tree that Brazil nuts come from, but I assume they will be. Really weird if Brazil nuts came from a different tree that is not Brazil wood. Okay, moving on. The prototypes of aspirin, painkillers, and fever reducers come from which of the following trees? The prototypes of aspirin, painkillers, and fever reducers come from which of the following trees? A. Eucalyptus, B. Oak, C. Willow, D. Jojoba. It's Jo, right? Is it Ho? Oh, is it Yojoba? Yojoba. If someone knows, put it in the, in the uh, chat. But yeah, eucalyptus, oak, willow, and however you pronounce the last one. It's one of those classic words that you read so many times, but you hardly ever hear anyone say it, and you just think that's how it's pronounced. So, Professor Oak and Willow. Yeah. Now nah, this is not the Pokemon round, not yet. And question five: Contrary to the suggestion, the palm tree or traveler's palm in Progress Singapore Party's logo is neither a palm nor a tree. Which of the following is it most closely related to? A bamboo. B, ginger, C, pitcher plant, D, rice. Contrary to suggestion, the palm tree or traveler's palm in PSP's logo, which is featured, is neither, neither a palm nor a tree. Which of the following is it related to? I know last session I said we are going to start with the politics, but I was, I was done with politics. Marcus wasn't, so yeah. My fault, yeah. More trivia. So uh, Dr. Tan Cheng Bok also used the palm tree as his um, logo for the presidential elections. Yeah. So it's a case of what it is. Right. Moving on to the next one. I'm just going to quickly check the chat and see if anyone is shouting at me. Nope. And moving on to you in PUB for urology. Of course, there are very few things in you, right? So while the term diabetes was first used in 230 BCE, when was the condition first described? 230 BCE itself, 500 BCE, 1000 BCE, 1500 BCE. When was the condition diabetes first described? Okay, moving on. All but the smallest of mammals urinate at the same rate. On average, how long does it take for them to empty their bladders? All but the smallest of mammals urinate at the same rate. How long does it take for them to empty their bladders? A, 31 seconds. B, 11 seconds. C, 21 seconds. D, 
the rate varies with species and size. No cheating by timing yourself right now. Yeah. <laughs> 31 seconds, 11 seconds, 21 seconds, or D, there is no same rate. Oh, I mean, you could use a stopwatch to time yourself. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Which of the following is not a known use for human urine? urine. Which of the following is not a known use for human urine? A, medication. B, textiles, C, food fermentation, D, gunpowder production. Which of the following is not a known use for human urine? Medication, textiles, food fermentation, gunpowder production. Okay. Moving on. Which animal's urine bears a similar order? to that of marijuana or the cannabis plant. Which animal's urine bears a similar odor to that of marijuana or the cannabis plant? A, a binturong, B, a maned wolf, C, Asian palm civet, or D, the red panda? Which of these following animals urine is gonna smell like weed? That's what we wanna know. It was such a strong smell that like people got what's the word for it? Worried. Law enforcers got involved. So yeah. Moving on. Human urine is commonly acidic, true or false. Human urine is commonly acidic, true or false. Gressel asks, ask Bear Grylls for question five. Yep. He, he, he doesn't know the answer to that. He just knows that you should drink it. And that's about it. Well, he will know the taste. <laughs> Acidic things tend to be sour, right? Hydrogen ions or something like that. Potentially, I think. Is, 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 that, is that common for all acidic things? Okay. Yeah. All right, moving on to babies. The last term, babies. What? Baby animal or animals is or are known as puggle. What baby animal or animals are known as puggle? Oh yeah, and I think this round is uh, pretty much open-ended because you guys get too many options all the time. So yeah, let's do some open-ended writing. What animal, baby animal is known as a puggle or what baby animals are known as puggles? Could that be a baby pug? Oh, apparently, a pug and a beagle cross is known as a puggle. Ooh. Yeah, because I was Googling up for pictures of a puggle uh, when I was making the quiz, right? And uh, yeah, I got a lot of pictures of pug beagle crosses. A young owl is an owlet. Thus, a young hawk is an auklet. True or false? A young owl is an owlet. A young hawk is an auklet. True or false? Does that make a baby bull a bullet? <laughs> nice one. Mm -hmm. I waited three days to use this. Three days. <laughs> the young cow is a cowlet. Grapples. See, I thought you were going to say cutlet there, but yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. Question three. Name one non-terrestrial pup. Name one non-terrestrial pup. Which means, name me an animal that is not from the land whose babies are called pups. So I've got a bunch of answers for these, but I don't think I've got them all covered. So later when you're going through the answers, if you guys got issues, drop them there and let's see whether I learn something new. And please don't tell me it's like a wet puppy or something, you know, like a puppy you threw in the pool. That's not terrestrial. All right, moving on. Aside from ugly duckling, what's another name for a baby swan? Aside from ugly duckling, what's another name for a baby swan?
No, it's not Swanlet. <laughs> Did someone say Swanlet? Gretel. You were going to say Swanlet even before I opened the chat. Okay, moving on. Which has a larger baby relative to its body size? The blue whale or the giraffe? Which animal has a larger baby relative to its body size, the blue whale or the giraffe? Okay. And I like the side eye that the whale's giving us. Nice. All right. Uh, if you guys, uh, before I go on, let's take 30 seconds. Does anyone need any questions repeating? If not, uh, we will carry on with the answers. Did someone say something? Jan says, I was starting to say that I'm starting to miss the comparison type of question. Her wish has been fulfilled. Yes, I had to throw one in. Yeah, man, always. <laughs> okay, and here we go. Answers for plant. Phytology is uh, another name for botany. Phytology is another name for botany. Okay, C, phytology. Question two, 85% of extant plant life is found in the oceans. 85% of extant plant life is found in the oceans. Just when you thought it was safe to go back. I mean, you can, like, you know, it's not like ocean plants are gonna eat you. And false, <laughs> and false, Brazil wood does not get its name from the country of Brazil. It's the other way around. The country gets its name from the tree. Due to it, there were a lot of Brazil woods, apparently, when uh, people came to Brazil. So, yeah. And willow is where the prototypes for aspirin painkillers and fever reducers come from. Willow is the answer for question four. And five, the palm tree or the traveler's palm in PSP's logo is more closely related to ginger. And it's more closely related to the ginger, and it's not a true palm. Yes, it is. Ginger berries. For yep. it's close. Uh, yeah. 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 Family, family, right? Or, or the family, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And urology answers. Diabetes was first described in 1500 BCE. Uh, I think it was described around the same time in both. Indian and Persian, but Indian and Persian, uh, I want to say scholars, but they're not scholars, like medical people, prehistoric doctors, yes. Physicians. Physicians, yes, thank you. And uh, nearly all animals, except for the tiniest ones, take 21 seconds to empty their bladder. So a cat, you, an elephant will all take 21 seconds on average. If you're going to try it out next to an elephant, stand far away. And food fermentation is not one of the known uses for uh, human pee. However, the rest of them are. Medication, people take them regularly. And for textiles, I think it's the Scots who do it and can't for the production. It's a common thing. And the main wolf's urine smells like weed. So much so that uh, zoo goers actually started complaining to authorities that keepers were smoking behind the main wolf enclosure, but they weren't. It was just the main wolf doing what main wolves do and marking his scent. And, uh, yep. And true. Human urine or pee is commonly acidic. Moving on to babies. Uh, I went quite fast there. Did anyone need any answers again? Yes, no? Alrighty. Let's go, babies. And puggles are baby echidnas or baby... Platypus. For a while, I started to think the plural for platypus, and I decided to go platypus. So yeah, platypus or echidnas are puggles. Both of them are egg-laying mammals. Oh, well, three of them, because there's two species of echidnas. And false. A young hawk is not a hawklet. It's called an eas. E-Y-A-S, eas. That's also the name for a young falcon. And for terrestrial pups, you can do bats, sharks, pinnipeds, otters. If anyone's any, any other, other pups, answers, yeah. 
let me know. Pretty pets are like seals, sea lions, walrus. That's that's about it. So you get bat pups, shark pups, seal pups, and otter pups. Or otters are also called kits. Okay. I'm just going to move on. If anyone has got any uh, issues with pups or you've got a different kind of pup, let me know. And Signet, I think that's how it's pronounced, is the name for a baby swan. So you can stop calling them ugly ducklings. Maybe that's why they're so angry all the time. <laughs> they get bullied in their childhood and get called ugly ducklings. And question five, the giraffe has the larger baby relative to its body size and not the blue whale. What about Fun fact. Oh, but chic. Hmm. Let you arbitrate, I can't know. Uh, I don't know, man. I've never heard anyone call it a swan chick before. <laughs> I mean, I mean, L L Lydia's in the thing here, and she's she knows swans. She has seen swans. Lydia, does anyone has anyone said swan chick and not signet? Nope, that's a no from Lydia. So I'm sorry, Audrey. Objection overruled. And yeah, giraffe is the last answer. Bonus round. Take it away. All right. So quickly, please update your scores, tally up your scores, and put it onto the Google Sheet for each round. It automatically adds up your total score. And as we move into the bonus round very quickly, uh, you wager the number of points uh, you have from one to the maximum number of points you have. And you gain the number of points you wager if you answer the bonus question correctly and you lose the number of points, you wager it if you are wrong. So if you've got all correct, 10, 15 points, you can wager 1 to 15 points, you get it correct, you get 30 points. If you got the bonus question wrong, you get zero points, right? So stakes are high, please fill up your scores, your beneficiaries, uh, your, and your wager. Yep. We are just missing lead here. And as always, uh, you can only wager what you have. Do not wager 100 points. When you have like thousand. 10 yeah, or a thousand points and be like, I got the last one right. Doesn't work that way. So we try to put in Lydia's score. Lydia's got 10 points. All right. Uh, shall we carry on? Uh, no, they're just still updating their wages. I see oh, you okay. change. Just waiting for Lydia's. All right. Mind. So we've got it all in now. So okay. Bonus question, go! And really? <laughs> what organization am I working at now? And bonus point for correct department or team. So if you get it correct, uh, yeah, so yeah. you win your wager. If you get uh, the department or team correct, you get one extra point. Yeah. So Kanan actually didn't know this was coming. Yeah, I didn't because I gave you a different question to ask, right? <laughs> so what organization am I working at now? And you get bonus point for my precise department or team. I can see that some, some people are like thinking really hard that people have told to where I'm working and what I'm working as. It will be another 15 seconds for you to write it down. It's not yep. fair. Yep. Not a, but depending on what you write down, it could be a long name or a short name. Yep. And the and thing is, right, the bonus point is only for my, uh, uh, for my team name, for my team or my department. So if you get the organization right and you wager on it, it should be good. Because I think a lot of people who know where I work have, will have issues with my department team. This is like Chandler, you know. What does Chandler work as? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody knows, man. Right, uh, Marcus, you let me know when everyone has uh, dropped their... Well, everyone has dropped their wager, so I think um, we could review the answers. Okay, yeah, everyone's good, yeah? Awesome. And I work with Acres, and I'm part of their wildlife management team. Yep. So, yes. So, if you get wildlife management team, or, yeah, wildlife management team, you get an extra point, and you get your wager if you get acres or if you put the full form of acres, which is Animal Concerns Research Education Society. Nice one. So Sidway asks, how about monkey bonus? Do I get the bonus, unfortunately? What do you say? Anbu? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> you could nod or shake your head. I feel like monkey cutting isn't the entire job though. Oh, you're going to give it? Okay, cool, but yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Sinway says he get yeah. Sinway Anbu says he can get the extra point if you put monkey guarding. So if anyone else has put monkey guarding, you can get it. Uh, wildlife management team is the full term. So yeah. And as usual, if you've got all the answers and everything, send us your completed answer sheet to no to sgstem talktrivia at gmail .com. I think Marcus will probably drop that in the chat box shortly. And you yeah. can update your scores at tiny URL. And uh, yeah. Should and also, up. yeah, and, my, and probably we will announce the unofficial winner soon. And we will yeah. uh, announce the official winner like sometime over the weekend. Yep. And uh, so henceforth, uh, you are known as Team Monkey Goddess. Is, is that what the team is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yep, not too late to contribute to the trivia pod. We usually, um, Kanan would actually uh, compile all of this and then make the donation by Sunday or Monday. Yeah, usually I do try to do it like by Sunday night, so people got time to like send it over the weekend. Because initially when we started, there were people still sending me money on like Monday as well. So I was like, oh, sorry to push it over to like the next week's talk when we used to do weekly talks. So yeah, so just send it and stuff. And if you guys need details, right, for donations and stuff, you all can contact me or contact Marcus and we'll just give you the links for PayPal or for PayNow. Right? Okay. Uh, Marcus, what's what's the what's the verdict on that side for the uh, unofficial winners? It seems to be Palm Civet, who is the unofficial winner for today. Who is Palm Civet? I think it's ah. Jen. Is it Jen? Yeah. All right, excellent. So congratulations. And our beneficiary is Akers. So congratulations to Akers. Oh, superb. Excellent. So all of today's, this week's donations will go towards Acres. Excellent. Um, so yeah, congratulations, Team Palm Civet. And you we have a it. final slide. Yeah. Oh, yes. So our next and speaker. This is mm -hmm. for our next, sorry, yeah, this is for our next talk, which is happening on the 13th of August. Uh, go on, Marcus. So, uh, Mr. Tony O'Dempsey is from the Nature Society of Singapore and he's going to talk about putting the art back into cartography. So, Tony is a GIS expert. He used to be a director at uh, Erdas, Laker Geospatial System, so he knows a lot about making maps. So, he's going to talk about how um, the modern map makers, making software actually takes out a lot of um, uh, the art of, of, of communicating uh, spatial information effectively. So he's going to talk about how, what are some strategies that can put this back in uh, so that, that make maps look beautiful and easy to understand. So that should be applicable to lots of us, right? So stay tuned. Now come, come join us on 13 August. We already have a couple of signups. So uh, as usual, what we do every week is that we encourage you to turn on your camera so that we could do a selfie. <laughs> 